In this episode, we'll be talking about the big gap between what clients want and what they actually need. We'll talk about the dangers of service design falling into simple recipes and checklists rather than continuing to be a holistic problem-solving approach. And we'll talk about why service designers like you need to focus much more on producing outcomes rather than deliverables. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, this is Greg Lakluffy, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark, and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you do more work that makes you proud by designing and delivering services that have a positive impact on people's lives and are good for business. My guest in this episode of the show is Greg Lakluffy. Greg is one of the co-founders of Surf Design Dallas and he is also a in the board of directors of the uh, AIGA in Dallas. The main theme of this episode is we will be talking about the dangers of service design falling into simple checklists, to-do lists, um, oversimplified methods and tools. And while tools and methods are useful and can be, can be really helpful, we need to constantly be aware that there's much more to service design than just these tools and methods. And then we need to approach this field with a more holistic mindset. So we're going to look at how to do that and what we can do to prevent, like I said, service design from falling into these simple, oversimplified tools, methods, recipes, and checklists. If you're a regular viewer of the show, you know that we post a new video on this channel at least once a week. And if you're new to this channel, make sure to subscribe and click that bell icon so you'll be notified when new videos are out. And if you haven't done so already, make sure to check out our Instagram page where you'll find some cool content that's not included here on YouTube. So that's all for the introduction. And now let's quickly jump into the interview with Greg. Welcome to the show, Greg. Thank you, Mark. Really looking forward to our discussion because I think it's going to cover some topics that a lot of service designers relate to. But before we dive into those topics, could you give like a 30 second introduction who you are? Sure. Um, so I am uh, Greg Lacluvi. I am a principal uh, consultant at Slalom Consulting in uh, Dallas, Texas. Um, and I am um, in somehow charge of expanding the service design uh, capability through our company and through our clients and try to expand their uh, horizon in terms of going from product to services to ecosystems and make sure that everything works according to plan. And you're also sort of uh, cheering on and motivating the community in and around Dallas, right? The, the service design community. That's true. We have um, we have uh, started a couple of years ago um, a, a meetup group, which is kind of a, a semi-organized chapter to uh, spread the uh, knowledge of service design in Dallas. As you know, yeah. service design is being very um, very well received and very very uh, accepted in Europe for quite some times. Um, in the U.S., it's still very much work in progress. We're still very much trying to get people to uh, think of service design as a capability and a discipline. Um, there's a bit of a confusion fusion in terms of uh, design thinking versus service design versus other kind of a design sprints in the US. So our goal is to make sure that people who are stumbling uh, upon service design understand what it is. Um, most of them are already using this for, for, for quite some time. Like UI UX designers have been doing service design without really knowing about it. Mm -hmm. um, they want to know more about it. Um, some UI designers um, are interested in becoming service designer, um, if, if that is a thing. Um, so we're just trying to meet once a month uh, and kind of like, you know, explain to people what the tools are. Um, we have one coming next week about stakeholder mapping um, to, to kind of like, you know, broad the range of uh, the tool set that people have currently here in the U.S. at least. Cool. So if people are in the re uh, sort of region of Dallas, make sure to reach out to Greg and uh, he can guide you through the service design community there. Greg, do you remember? Because that's the question I always ask uh, my guests. Do you remember the very first time you got in touch with service design? 
You know, I'm going to say the very first time I realized I was doing service design uh -huh. um, was probably well, I was working at Capital One, which is one of our main clients here. And I was working with uh, Jamin Hageman, who was the uh, head of design for financial services at Capital One. Um, this is when I started to realize that um, through Adaptive Path, which was acquired by Capital One, um, what I was doing, which was you know, user interviews, side-by-sides, um, blueprinting was basically service design. So I was like, hey, I've been doing this, so there's probably more for me to learn. And um, I started to dig into it and, and you know, buy some books and like everybody else, and now I'm doing service design full time. Mm -hmm. Jamin, Jamin uh, has been a guest on the show and I think everybody knows him. He's now moving to, to New York, so. Mm -hmm. Greg, you gave me three really interesting topics. I gave you some uh, f almost famous service design show question starters. Are you ready to do some interview jazz? Sure, let's do it. Okay. Topic number one I prepared you know, for you here on these papers is, is want versus need. And do you have a question starter that goes along with this one? And can you show it to us? Hmm, let me see. I think I'm going to go with how can we? How can we? So I think that one of the um, so we have a lot of clients here uh, through you know, being a consultant, and I think it's very uh, it's very interesting the fact that um, um, there are some very big differences between what the users need and what the business need versus what the, the business wants. So very often we get into a room and we talk to the stakeholders, the C-suite, and they have a they have a fairly clear understanding of what their needs could be, um, but it. It translates very quickly to what we want. We want more features, we want more buttons, we want more, more bells and whistles and more shiny toys, uh, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But as we start digging into it and doing the, the, the due diligence of like you know, doing like contextual interviews and user interviews, usually we start realizing that what they want may not be necessarily what they need. And this is kind of like um, this is what the service designer or the researcher needs to be um, working on their diplomatic skills, so to speak, when you actually go back to the client and push back. So like, we've heard you, we understand that you want to add, you want to have a new app or you, have a, you want to have a new feature or a new button or whatever it is. And going back to them and tell them like, well, we've, we've looked into this and we think that maybe what you need is not that. We think what you need is actually be something else altogether. Um, and you'd be surprised. Usually it's actually very, very well received because they've made some huge assumptions, again, not doing the due diligence and research. And they've kind of like assumed or did some very basic internal research. Um, and they just say, hey, you know, company X is doing this. I think we should be doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's just not true. Sometimes you should be you know, spending your, your, your time and resources and efforts somewhere else. Um, so that's a very big uh, a key differentiator for service design to be able to go in um, and really start uh, discussing what is it you really need as a business or what do your users need versus what they want. Yeah, and I think this is something a lot of us recognize. Again, I recognize this at least in our most of our projects. In We've even formalized this in our approach and in our process where we always say we're going to reframe the challenge, whatever it is. So mm -hmm. we, whatever the challenge is that comes onto our table, we're going to reframe it and look at it from a fresh perspective. But like you said, and I haven't expressed it in, a, in that way, but it does require some uh, diplomatic skills to, and especially in organizations who are sort of driven by ex experts, expertise, like manufacturing companies, stuff like that. How, what have you found? How do you, have you found ways that make it easier to ease clients into this new perspective instead of them pushing back? Well, I think the easiest way is to show data, right? So, you know, you go in and you spend two or three weeks with internal users or the external users, in this case, if it's, an, if it's a, a customer facing application. Um, and when you go back to your stakeholders, you've done your homework, you've actually have uncovered some truth uh, or some insights at least, and being able to expose them to those data, it's, it's really hard to push back on yeah. something that is factual. So 
we have spent three weeks doing this. We have found out this. So we have a, a, a wall of research or we have, we have some clusters, some, some insights, and we have found out those 10 things. Um, it, it just, uh, and usually it's, it's, it could be a pretty shocking truth to them. They, they, sometimes they have no idea that this is happening in their very own stores, their very own you know, system. So um, to me, that is the easiest thing to do. It's kind of like, if they push back, I can pull back my documents like, hey, you know, on that day, this interview, this user had said so. We can just put a quote, and and it's just kind of hard to agree with that. Those are your own employees or your own customers. Mm. Yeah, and that's the, I think you are hitting what is it the, the nail on the head there. I don't know. Is that an English saying? I think so. It's at least a Dutch saying. But um, when you present data uh, and you show like real users, real customers, real employees, then it uh, you take it away from being a discussion about me versus the client, but you, you make it like, this is what your customers are saying. It's not about what I think, this is what the reality is saying, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, it's very interesting. So there's somebody on my team uh, who is uh, who is basically um, highly qualified in this kind of like qualitative and quantitative research. And as soon as you realize that everything can be quantified, everything can be qualified versus being a sentiment or versus being like, you know, click or whatever it is, then it's so much easier. You can literally baseline everything and you can just measure everything from like, right now we have this problem and we're going to measure this through the next three weeks and we're going to end up with like a different number, a different fact. That is very, very compelling for a customer or a client to kind of like, okay, this is working, it's not working, let's, let's do something else. Hmm. What, what have you found? Because uh, showing field research data, quotes, videos, interviews always works, but what have you found to be the biggest hurdle in uh, sort of explaining to clients that what they think they need is not the thing they need? What is the biggest hurdle in there? Well, I think the biggest hurdle, and maybe I've been, I've been, you know, fortunate enough not to have to go through hurdles per se. They usually see, see the light pretty quickly. Mm. Um, and again, I've been fortunate to work with clients who are familiar with design thinking and, and, and service design. And, and so they're, they're much more open to um, alternative solutions. Um, but yeah, usually, I mean, what I like to show them very quickly is, um, uh, is options. Uh, people, you know, are, are people. Um, they like to be able to to have an opinion on something. And if you go back to them, if just some research, they'd be like, okay, it's research. Um, but if we actually go the extra mile, sometimes which is necessarily asked of us, and we can say, hey, those are three solutions we think may work for you. You know, it's A, B, C. This is a very creative, very out of the box ID. Um, there is a very kind of like a mid range solutions. Um, and then there is like a very conservative solution, which could be like, you know, adding a button or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, they respond very well because immediately the mind frame is very, is very, is very different because now they actually see, okay, we can do this. We cannot do that. This is not going to go. Um, because they live in a very different world. I have no visibility into what they go through, the budget, the, all those things. Um, so if you go back to them and say, Hey, you have a problem, which they're aware of it. Here are three possible solutions we can implement for you over the next three weeks, three months, three years. Um, then they have a better idea. It's something tangible. They can say, okay, let me think about this. Let me go back to you know my boss or whoever it is, mm. and then we can talk about this. Hmm. So maybe, maybe if I understand you correctly, the biggest hurdle might be for them not being able to make the things you're saying actionable, right? If they don't know how to act on it or... Yeah, well, I think the biggest problem is that most people have a difficult time uh, uh, envisioning the solution. You know, exactly. they, can, they can they can they can understand it what you're telling them, but kind of actually just putting themselves in the future and see what this could be mm -hmm. um, is is a very big problem that a lot of people have, especially if you're dealing with people who are not in the ideation space or the creative space. You know, somebody's line of business who's just in charge of doing like, you know, home loans. Um, you know, yeah. when you're talking about like, you know, ideation, they don't even know, you know, they don't, they don't, they can't really wrap their heads around that. So for them being able to see some very tangible, okay, this is email one, email two, email three, which one do you think would work the most with your employees? They will tell you immediately, oh, this is not going to work. They will have an opinion, but you have to kind of like help them get there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Let's move on into topic number two. And... <clears throat> We have service design 
thinking we have service design doing and now we also have service design understanding <laughs> do you have a question starting can you show it to us um so so that was a little bit of a, of a stab to my friend mark uh, stigdorn so i met with him uh, last summer he was doing like a, a class in new york and i was i was fortunate for him to meet with him and we had some fun talks afterward um so this was mostly referring to um a little bit of an issue that we're seeing currently what? in in the space. Did you have a oh. question starter, Greg? I'm not sure. To show we need. How about what? You can go wrong. Why? So why? Um, why is service design understanding? I I have been um, discussing this offline with several people, and there is kind of like um, um, a bit of a. Of a interesting uh, shift in the service design uh, discipline currently. Um, we have a lot of people who spend a lot of time using uh, tools and methodology they have learned through you know, books or videos or, or podcasts. Um, but that is, that is all they do. So service design as a, as a whole has some research and it has some ideation, some prototyping, there is some building. You know, service design is a very holistic methodology that you can actually just tackle any possible problem. Um, it's very wide and it's very deep. Um, but um, you see a lot of people who have, as, as we just said, stumbled into a service design by chance or by accident. Um, and have been given a book. So for example, service design doing, service design thinking, and they've read the book several times and they love it. Um, and they are applying uh, those rules or those guidelines very methodically, which is, which is great. Um, but they are just tools and they're just way for us to get to a place, which is a solution space. Um, and fortunately, a lot of people um, are not understanding service design so you do all your research you do all your 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 fact checking and you gather your stuff um and then you have to be able to create uh, an insight out of this what am i finding out what am i solving what is the problem I'm trying to, to 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 resolve here um and i have been uh, in places uh, at clients where there would be some research done there would be some some uh, user lab done there would be some some very thorough methodology being done and then they would be putting all the post-its on the wall and they would just mixing them up. Um, and then they would basically just take those post-its and they would, you know, t-shirt size them or kind of like order them a priority. Okay. Those are quick wins. And they would literally take those post-its and they would go to designers and basically tell them, okay, fix this. You have two sprints to fix those six problems. Some of them are mm -hmm. very small, make this font bigger, make this button from blue to green and off you go. So this is what we call designing through Jira kind of approach, where you basically have all those items and you log them up in a system and then sprint one, we can tackle this. So the problem we're having here is that service design thinking, um, again, to go back to Mark, was a, was a wonderful book and it's, it's wonderful uh, thinking. And there is a doing part of it. But what we need to focus on right now is the understanding part of it. So um, those are all tools. You know, and we've talked about this offline in the past. Um, where uh, I think your metaphor was about a chef. You no, know, a chef doesn't, you know, give knives and forks and cutting boards and blenders. He produces a meal. So I think there is a danger of being too caught up and too enamored with the tools, um, like like a blueprint, for example. It's a wonderful artifact that people love and gather. It's, it's a wonderful artifact to create internally, but it is just a way to get to the solution. You know, now we actually have a map. That is not, that is not, an, it's just an artifact, it's just a tool for us to get somewhere. Yeah. And this is, I think we are seeing this, I would call this that the, the fact that service design is being productized, it's being put into boxes, which is easily trainable, which is easily sold by consultancies, like uh, just follow these recipes and then you'll be okay. Right. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I've had this discussion also with people, and I think uh, the, the upside of this is it makes it more accessible for people coming in and trying to uh, understand the, the field. But on the other hand, if you just stop there and don't understand why you're following this recipe and why you need these certain ingredients, you'll, you'll sort of never be able to um, improvise and uh, make it contextualize basically the methodology. like. I, I really like your analogy of a chef. It's like he's maybe he's following a recipe, but he knows why he why he's adding certain ingredients, why he's 
using certain tools, right? And that's, that's I think, what you are also saying. You need to understand when to use what and why. Yeah, and, and it is difficult because when you go and you answer an RFP, you go to your client, they, they want to know what am I getting? What, what am I going to get? You know, how much is going to cost? How long is it going to take? How many people are going to be involved? They want to know those things. And it's very easy for us to go back to them and say, okay, we're going to come in and we're going to be doing those five things. And then we're going to move on. We're going to be doing those six things. And we're going to move on and those seven things. And it's just very easy, you know, and, and it's quite frankly the only way we've, we've been able to do this so far because the client wants to know, I'm not going to give you $100,000 and just have you guys for six weeks. What am I getting out of it? So they have to be uh, understanding from both sides of the fence that service design is a very different uh, approach to solving a problem. Um, and I usually use the, uh, the um, iron triangle that Mark actually has in his book, where for the past 3,000 years, um, every single design architecture landmark project has always been like you know, this shape, where you basically start with, a, with an ID, we're going to be doing, we're going to be building a bridge. How long is it going to take? How much people is it going to take? And how much money is it going to take? And then you end up with the triangle going wider at the base. When you go out of budget, you have it's taking twice as long, all those things. <laughs> um, but that's fairly easy. You go back to the, the owners, like, hey, no, you know, we need more money. OK, we get more money. We need more people. OK, whether you're building a bridge or a pyramid or a product, it's been like this for 3,000 years. Service design is very different because we've actually flipped the triangle. Now we're basically starting at the very top, where it basically says, we have no idea what we're looking for. We have no idea what the problem is. We have basically an idea that no, you're not selling enough you know, toys, but we don't really know what the problem is. So we have to start very, very, very wide. And people are kind of like not used to that. What do you mean you don't know what you're going to find out? Well, we don't know what we don't know. So we have to go in and find that out. And as we go down the project, we're actually going to go down to the solution, which is going to be unique and clearly defined. But at the very top, we just have no clue. We can be here yeah. for six weeks and knock it out, or we can be here for six years. Um, so it's a very different mindset, especially when you go to be where you're going to pay for it, because they don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear it's going to take 10 years. They want to hear how long it's going to take and how much I'm to, supposed to give you for to pay for it. So hmm. it's, it's, it's where the understanding comes in and being able to talk to your client and make them understand that um, this may be super easy and we're going to fix the problem very quickly, or this may be taking you know 10 years and you got to rethink your entire business, uh, how it's being approached, which um, just recently, I stumbled upon a, a research from the USA, which is a very big insurance company here in the US. And 10 years ago, they've actually uh, imp uh, implemented service design. Um, and it's taken them 10 years to get to a place where they had to literally reinvent the entire business, how they function internally, how the, the process are going through. They stopped selling products and kind of like re rearrange the whole company through life events. Um, and it's working great. I think the NPS scores are consistently, it's not perfect, but it's consistently in the 70s, which is world-class uh, rating. So uh, it was a major investment for them 10 years ago, uh, and it's paying off uh, in a big time right now. Yeah, the, I, what I always try to, the story I always try to tell, you know, what's the alternative if you don't do the investment? You know, where would you be in 10 years now? Would you still exist as a company? So was it a big investment? Well, if you compare the alternative scenarios, I don't know. Well, one last question about this topic, and this is like, okay, so we, we know we have those service design books, we know we have those recipes, we know we have those two-day training workshops. L let's say that those are fine, that they, they also have a place and uh, are needed. What can we do to balance that, sort of to bring more service design understanding? How can we make that more bring it more in line? Well, I, again, I hate to say this, but it starts with us. You know, this, mm -hmm. is, this is people talking to people, people who have problems, problems who have challenges, people who have issues. And I think it starts with us, uh, service designers, not to be, uh, to be too uh, in love with our tools. It's just kind of like, you know, what are we trying to do here? Be a bit more of a, of a, of a curious mind uh, we just happen to have a large set of tools, which probably will double by next year. I'm sure as we go, because every problem we have, yeah. um, I consistently invent new tools with my team because the tool we used last week for this client is not working for this one. So we have to somehow reinvent ourselves all the time. And this is not something very comfortable for a lot of people. So um, one of the things we do for our team here is, I can tell you the last four or five people we've actually hired here for our team, um, is that we 
really don't spend a lot of time looking at the hard skills and the tools, so to speak. We, we spend more time hiring the people and the soft skills. Um, and this goes back to, um, uh, you know, like Eric Widmar from uh, Expedition Mondiale in Sweden. Um, they have done like a, a study about uh, basic patterns of service designers, those people, who they are, what they do. Um, and it, it's a very interesting um, findings that they found out that there is definitely a pattern of, of people who are actually really good service designer. They're very curious. They're always eager to learn. They want to know more about people. They have a high level of listening. They have very large uh, empathy. Um, and in that list, nowhere it says they're really good at Sketch or Photoshop. Those are just tools again. Uh, but if you move away from the tools, you kind of look at the people themselves. We need to hire people who are really good at solving problems, at listening, at questioning themselves, mm -hmm. at creating the problems. So I think it starts with us being better at understanding the problem versus trying to solutioning immediately through the tools and the methodology. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree. Um, topic number three, and I, we already touched upon this one. So let's see if we can add something to, uh, <clears throat> to the discussion we've had so far. Outcomes, 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 outcomes. Um, the topic of outcomes. Um, I guess I'm not sure when will outcomes. Um, what did you want to talk about outcomes? I forget now. Well, the outcomes was, I think, also the discussion between us seeing ourselves as a community that produces customer journey maps, personas, service blueprints, stakeholder maps versus a community that produces impact, business value, better healthcare, right? I think that's what we touched upon. Yeah, I think we just started to discuss that and we can we can we can talk about it a bit more. But um, yeah, I think that we have to really be focused on the outcome. What are we trying to solve here? And I think sometimes you just start by asking the right question. We're discussing this with, with somebody in my office yesterday. Um, we're talking about the, uh, the the Disney World Magic Bands, for example. Um, as a user now, you look at them and you just don't really, you know, you, you see the value of it, obviously, but when you're trying to actually dig into it and kind of like the service design approach to it, it started beginning by asking the right question. Um, and the right question was actually not how we're going to solve a key problem, how we're going to get people to not have a credit card with them. That wasn't the right question. The right question was how we're going to root at friction. That was literally the, the actual question that they were like, there is a lot of friction in the park at different levels and how we're going to solve for that. So their answer after many iterations, I'm sure, and some very, very, you know, a lot of testing and validation, they came with the magic band that allows you to open your key and to buy a whole bunch of stuff and everything is connected. You, you know, it's, it's a wonderful tool. Um, but that's, just, that's the outcome. That wasn't, the, that wasn't what they actually were expecting to find at the beginning. I'm sure they were probably trying to look at how, how we can get the lines shorter, you know, something very simple. Yeah, like yeah. That. It, could have been, it could have been addressed very easily. But the outcome is much broader. And this is where service design has a very holistic view, which is very valuable, is that we don't look at one particular problem. We don't tackle this, hey, people lose their keys. Let's spend five days do a design sprint and solve how we're going to be able to make people not lose their key, which is very valid. But service design goes very broad and very deep in terms of like, you know, we're going across channels, across silos in a customer journey. And then we go deep in terms of like how we're going to solve for those internally or externally and how we're going to have the right vendors, the right methodology, the right process, the right support. Um, and this is what gives the outcome. Now, <clears throat> now I hear the service design community sort of telling me in my ear, well, Greg, this is, this is great and all, but Unless you are talking with a CEO, you're not going to get such an assignment. When you're talking to middle managers who are often our clients, uh, they have much more, much smaller challenges, much more practical challenges. They, they are the ones who say, we need a customer journey map. What do we do? Because I don't, I don't think we all have the opportunity to take such a holistic view all the time. Well, I mean, the holistic view can be applied to anything. It doesn't really matter how small you want to smooth the of a problem. Um, it doesn't have to be a massive problem like Disney World, per se, but it could be a very simple internal problem that somebody doesn't know how to fix. And, and you have to start somewhere, right? So, for example, um, I personally, uh, every time I go to a project, I always immediately start doing a blueprint because it's a very valuable artifact people just kind of see. 
be able to actually go through the stakeholders and you'd be surprised. I mean, I'm actually always shocked when I actually do a, a very, and I start very, very high. I don't even do any research first. I just go in and I do what I call a hypothetical uh, blueprint. So based on huge assumptions of mm -hmm. what I've understood from discussion, I just put it in and it's just kind of like, you know, very big blocks. And then you see people start gathering around it, kind of like looking and say, oh, I had no idea this was happening over here. And oh, I had no idea. They're just so, so restrained into their silo that they literally have no idea what's happening before their group comes into play. And they sometimes have no idea what's happening after they're done playing that, we're, whether it being accounting or invoicing or whatever it is. Um, so you do, you kind of like lay it out for them. You can say, okay, this is what the journey is. And then you start refining it and get to a place kind of like, what tool are you using? What process are you using? Um, and then they are very excited about it because all of a sudden it's kind of like, this makes sense. I had no idea this was a problem. And you can very quickly uncover some, some small challenges who are sometimes um, a, a grain of sand in a machine and the whole machine can be just totally stuck within you know, several weeks because somebody has just forgotten something or somebody has just kind of like was misguided or somebody just left and uh, somebody mm. quit or somebody went on maternity leave yeah. and then an entire department just doesn't have any idea how to function with this one person. So um, that's what yes. the holistic view comes in. So th that's an interesting approach, like sort of when you are in a situation where you have to deal, and we, I think this is quite common, where you have to deal with people who uh, require tangible results on a short term, create those tangible results, but use them to sort of open up the discussion about the real challenges. So first satisfy the need for tangible results like a service blueprint that is hypothetical, but use that to open up the discussion about what is the challenge that we're actually trying to solve. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I personally see service design as being a tool or, or, or discipline for collaboration. I mean, I'm just a facilitator. You know, no one on my team has this, you know, I come from the addition space from the creative agencies where you have ideas and you sell those ideas to a client and they either hate them or they love them and they buy them. Here, we really have this aha moment where it's like, oh, we're going to solve this problem. It's, it's highly collaborative. You know, we just go in and we ask a bunch of questions and they have a bunch of, you know, possible solutions themselves. And then we kind of like combine it together, we gather it, we curate them and kind of like, you know, we have some, again, method that allows us to do that pretty, pretty systematically. But at the end of the day, this is all about collaboration and people talking to people and kind of like, finding out that there is somebody hurting over there and they're hurting because this other person is absolutely clueless that their system is just not talking to their system, you know? So sometimes it's just painfully simple solve. Um, I, I, I don't think I want, I don't know if I can bring that up, but there was a, there was Mark uh, Stigdor was telling us a story about this uh, travel agency. Um, I think it was in Germany or Austria. And they had this problem where some people were just like hanging up the phone, the, sales, the, the customer service were hanging up the phone within three seconds and 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 they had no idea why they said, what's happening so it came down to people were calling english speaking were talking to like a, a german uh, speaking uh, agents and they would hang up the phone on them immediately and they were just understanding what's happening over and over and over well it turns out that within three seconds or whatever the seconds the the call isn't logged in so if they hang up very quickly they didn't go against their their personal you know count so they'd be like oh english i'm hanging up so it doesn't go against my tally or my quote or my you know my incentive. So it was a very simple fix. And the basically just said, like, oh, this is gonna be very easy. If somebody calls to you speaking English, you transfer them to extension 3565 because Bob is speaking English and he will take those calls because he speaks English. So again, this is a very simple solution that was literally made of like post-its, just a piece of paper that was put into everybody's cubicle, and they were able to handle this very simple problem, but they had no idea. They had to get designers on the ground to kind of like look around and say, hey, why did you hang up the phone there? Oh, don't worry about it. It's an English speaking person. Okay, let me write that down. Um, so oh, yeah. it, those, are very, those are very simple problems that needs to be addressed. And people actually are doing this every day. I'm just not aware of that. They're just, they're just so used to it. For them, it's just natural. You just hang up the phone uh, because yeah. I want to get a bonus at the end of the month. You know, it's, it's a very simple people problem. I think that's also true what you're saying that what we often bring to the table isn't per se often, most often isn't the bright ideas it's just a fresh perspective and bring some common sense into organizations that's it's it's and and that's already really valuable um, yeah absolutely it's just not fair for us to go in and ask you know currently I'm working with some software engineers very 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 smart people who are talking 
a, a different language. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm, I'm, I don't understand half the words that, that they say. But when you actually start to ask some very simple questions, like, how are you doing this? They, they can't possibly answer the question to you in just plain English. They immediately go into what they know, which is this very complicated, sophisticated language, because this is what they know. And we're trying to kind of simplify this, but tell me more about this, but what do you mean by that? And eventually you get to the truth, you get to the point kind of like, we can't do our job because X, Y, Z. And they have a really hard time verbalizing that because this is what they've been doing for 15 years. To them, it's just, just the way it's been done and I'm yeah. just going to pick it up. Hmm. Greg, um, we're sort of heading towards the end of the episode, but as always, uh, I would like to give you the opportunity to ask us a question, the community. Is there something that you'd like us to think about? Um, I think that we, we had discussed this uh, before and I don't really have... I mean, the biggest question I have is that how do we get people to understand service design uh, in terms of, you know, uh, clients, you know, and I know we have, you have, a, you have a, a show about, you know, how do you sell service design? Because it is very difficult, you know, because it is so broad, it is so vague, it is so undefined. I mean, you know, as, as we know, if you ask 10 service designers a definition of service design, you're going to get 11 answers. <laughs> Um, because it's just it's just impossible to define. I mean, even here internally we struggle because, uh, and you know, this is we, we joke around here because now we see you know a hammer always sees a nail, right? So now every time I go to the store and I go on vacation, I see services and problems everywhere. Um, because we live in a society now that is going through a pretty massive transformation. We're going from you know we're trying to bring digital into physical. Um, and a lot of money is being spent on digital products and how do we get to this next stage? And we end up with some very fractured and fragmented experiences that you and I have this wonderful time online and we have an app, I think it's great. And then you actually go physically to the store and it's a whole different experience. It's, it's completely broken down. You're trying to pick up the food you've ordered, you know, you know, great experience online. And then you show up to the store to pick up your food and it's not ready or it's cold or it's missing, whatever. So, um, that's our biggest challenge here is to make sure that um, our clients understand that we can help them through this and that it's not always a question of resources, of money, it's not just a question of understanding and being able to kind of like talk to each other and kind of like, okay, are you sure you want to have a new app? Are you sure you want to have a new product? Are you sure those questions are kind of like common sense to you and I, because we do this all the time, before a client has been doing this for, to work for like, you know, a travel agency or, or, or an airline, um, they may not be very used to or, 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 or ready to have those questions asked to them. But what if we just, you know, don't do it this way? And they get very, they get very close that very quickly because mm -hmm. they just don't want to hear that. So I'm not really quite sure how you are doing this in your particular consultancy or the other people out there, but like, how do you get people to stop thinking them of boxes and features and products and kind of like opening their mind into, okay, we can do so much more than, than just, you know, creating mm. new boxes. I think that's one of the most valuable and important discussions we can have as a community. How do we do that? So <laughs> I'm really looking forward to, to the comments people leave. And it's a, it's a tough question. It's a tough question, but mm. this is what the show is for sort of asking the hard questions and, getting the smart people in the community together to, to think about it. So thanks, uh, Greg, for asking this. And also, thanks for sharing your thoughts and ideas about the other topics, because I think every single one is like uh, a really important thing that we can't ignore. We need to address um, here and um, great for bringing that up. So thanks. You're very welcome. My pleasure. What is your biggest takeaway from this episode with Greg? Leave a comment down below and let us know. If you enjoyed this episode and know somebody who might enjoy it as well, make sure to grab the link and share that with them. And if you'd like to learn how to explain service design in plain English, check out the free course that I've got for you over here. Thanks so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.